Remembering that we're in this series where we're discussing the overarching truths that we find in Scripture that have the potential to change our lives. And just want to say, the intro to this sermon is dedicated to Dane Johnson. It's the only Christmas present he's going to get from me, but this is a little present for him. And it's, it's, it starts with George Carlin, who did a kind of a comedy spoof on the whole idea of the difference between football and baseball. And he starts out the comedy routine by saying that football is played on the gridiron, while baseball is played in a park. Kind of a fun little place. You can just hear Dane Johnson right now saying amen, right? Football players, he says, wear helmets, you know, hard, hard hats. Baseball players wear caps with cute little designs on them. He says in football, there's a specialist who comes in to kick something. Baseball, a specialist comes in to relieve somebody. Football has the two-minute warning. Baseball, the seventh inning stretch. Football has sudden death, which is, uh, sounds kind of ominous, doesn't it? But baseball gets extra innings, not just innings, but extra innings. And in football, he says, the runner will give you a stiff arm. In baseball, the runner gets the slide. It's kind of fun. And he goes on to say the biggest difference, however, between football and baseball is that the major objective in the game of football is that football is a battle fought in the trenches. You have the field general, the quarterback, who seeks to evade the blitz, soften up the enemy line with a pounding ground attack and aerial bombardment. He will mix bullet passes with the occasional going for the bomb to penetrate the enemy defenses and reach the end zone. While in baseball, the object is to go home. Just go home. Kind of a beautiful thing. Peaceful, sentimental, lovely thing. Now, I've told you for, from the beginning, I love Christmas. I love Christmas music. This year, you've got two options. Have you noticed? You've not only got 103.5, you've also got 94.7, The Wave, 24-hour full-time Christmas music. So when one plays a commercial, you can switch the dial over to the other. You got 24-7 Christmas music. It's a good thing. Two of the songs you're going to hear this time of year, I think you hear them probably 10 to 15 times a day, is first of all, there's no place like home for the holidays, popularized by who? Believe it or not, Perry Como, 1954, long time ago. And if you're like me, you're thinking, are we ever going to write any new Christmas music? And then there's the other song, I'll be home for Christmas, popularized by who? Bing Crosby in 1943. Elvis gets credit for everything. But there's a great irony in the Christmas story, folks. It's great irony, and understanding the irony will help us gain the true meaning message of the original Christmas and will, again, have the capacity to change the way we live. Now, you know as well as I do, when Christmas time comes around, people will get on airplanes and they will travel for miles, and people will drive through the snow. I mean, horrible snowstorms that you'd otherwise never go out in just to do what? To be home for Christmas. When Robin and I were down in Savannah, Georgia, and our in-laws were in Lexington, Kentucky, we're talking about a 10-hour drive. I had to speak Christmas Eve about midnight, so there's no way we were going to make it or at least try to drive through the night. We got up early the next morning, tired, worn out. We drove all day just to try to get to Lexington just so that we could be home for Christmas. Halfway through the journey, we're in the mountains somewhere, and my family and I got the privilege of eating Christmas dinner, Christmas lunch, at this very fine institution. (laughs) And I remember ordering a double Whopper with cheese and sitting outside wondering two things. Number one, I can't believe Burger King's open. And number two, how is it that I'm eating a double cheeseburger Christmas Day lunch? It was so sad. A little tear came down my face. Uh, feeling sorry for myself because we all want to be home for Christmas. Now, here's the irony. I've been staring at this nativity scene and looking at it since November 1st when we got it out. November 1st. You got Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, and you got the wise men or the kings, and you got the shepherds. And here's what I've noticed. Look, nobody's home. Nobody. Mary and Joseph aren't home. They're not in Nazareth. They've traveled to Bethlehem for the census. 
The wise men, they're not home. They've traveled a long, long distance to get here. And the shepherds, they're supposed to be out in the fields tending the sheep. By the way, who's tending the sheep? Did the angel say, guys, don't worry about it. I got the sheep covered. Follow the star. (laughs) Ravi Zacharias says this about the first Christmas. He says, Jesus was born a homeless person in a temporary shelter. He identifies with the homeless all throughout his ministry. And when he dies, he is buried in a borrowed grave. With what group of people did Jesus identify most with? Homeless people. Now, this leads me to some other questions. Stay with me. Why did God choose a homeless life for his son? Why not just set up shop in the downtown Jerusalem Hilton with all the conference rooms and do your discipleship there? Or maybe your home base could at least be at the Bethlehem Inn. Instead, the Bible says the Son of Man did not have a place to lay his head. And those questions are related to some others. I've often thought about every Christmas, why do we not have some article of clothing from Jesus? You know, in a British museum where we could all travel, this is the cloak Jesus wore. Or some piece of pottery that he made. Or maybe something that he carved out in the carpentry shop with his father. We have all kinds of other artifacts from that time period and even before why do we not have at least one thing? Why, why isn't there something that Jesus made in the carpentry shop that could be on display all around the world? Some skeptics say that that's why they don't believe in the historical Jesus. We just have nothing left over. Now, I believe the answer is related to this idea of home. Now, can you tell I'm feeling a bit better? Which means that we're going to go back to the old Jeff. We're going to place things in the funnel, and it's going to be confusing at first, but in the end, it'll all come out. And the truth will hit us right in the face and hopefully change us to some degree. Here's the point. I believe if you read through the Old Testament, if we do a jet tour, you discover that home was designed by God to be a glimpse of what life with God would be like. So what you experience in the home was supposed to be like a portal that you could see beyond your home and that life into what one day life would be in the presence of God. Let me give you a few examples. I've got to run through these quickly. One, home was supposed to be a place of unconditional love. It's supposed to be the place where you were loved for who you were. Now, some of you during this part of the message are going to struggle. You're going to say, well, la-di-da, I'm glad, but my home wasn't like that. And your home was a living hell. And you're still trying to get over it still today. You're still reaping some of that harvest an unhealthy harvest of the type of situation in which you grew up. I'm asking you to be patient. There's good news to come. But home was supposed to be a place of unconditional love. I've been reading uh, about an NFL quarterback, and I remember this happening about two or three years ago, a quarterback in the NFL that uh, was susceptible to concussion, concussion after concussion. And before the new season began, a reporter asked the quarterback, how do you decide whether you're going to play or not? I mean, you have concussions, it's dangerous, it must be getting more and more serious. And the quarterback responded by saying, before the season starts, I ask myself three questions. Number one, am I healthy? Number two, is it still fun? And he said, if the answer is yes, I play. Now, what's the problem there? That's two questions. Did you see that? I think this guy has had one too many concussions. (laughs) Now, listen, home is where you're accepted even when you look a little foolish or when you're not real smart, or even if you have a face that only a mother could love. That's home, unconditional love. Home's also supposed to be a place of grace and mercy. It's where when you blow it and you mess up, you're supposed to be able to come home and still be loved. Now, I tell this story often. My father, when I was 16 years old, he had laid down the law, and there were some unpardonable sins. In other words, if you violated this, you're probably going to get kicked out of the house, like hit your mother, something like that. But one of those violations... Well, I violated, and I couldn't sleep all night, 16 years old, remember this like it was yesterday. I got up the next morning, my father knew something was wrong, he sat on the couch beside me and he said, son, what what, what have you done? And I confessed my sin, it was easier to confess it than to harbor it and keep it in, I knew you'd find out anyway. And I'll never forget my dad when I confessed what I had done, scooting over on the couch close to me, putting his arm around me, and he said, you're forgiven. And that gave me a glimpse of what God is like. You see, most of us, our view of God is greatly impacted by our view of our Father. And if our view of our Father, our relationship with Him is skewed or screwed up, 
it makes it extremely difficult for us to ever really discover who God is. That's why the greatest Christmas gift you fathers could ever give your children is to show them that you submit to a higher authority and that although you're the father of the house, there is the father of the universe that will love them and give them the security and safety and belongingness that they need. Home is supposed to be a place of unconditional love, a place of mercy and grace. It's also a place of sacrifice. Now, some of you guys who are older in the room, you remember how hard our parents worked in order that we could eat and have clothing and have a roof over our heads. When my dad died, my brothers took me up to Hampton, Tennessee to see the old home place. Well, it's not there. All we found were trees and weeds and overgrown vines and branches. But we looked around at the place in which our father grew up, and we remembered that my dad referred to his home as the B&B, and it didn't stand for bed and breakfast. It stood for bread and berries because that's what he ate most of his young life. My dad worked two jobs most of his life to make ends meet. My mother went up to the wealthy part of our hometown and asked the wealthy people if she could clean their houses to make money to supplement my father's income. And both my mom and dad did it, not with some kind of bitterness, but they looked at it as an opportunity. They were happy to sacrifice, to do whatever it took so that their four sons could have a healthy and a life of vitality, to have a roof over their heads and food to eat and shoes on their feet. Home was a great place and is a great place where great amounts of sacrifice occur so the rest of us can live. It's also a place of belonging. Long before this whole thing called MySpace, where you can go on and reveal to the world things about your life, which I have no earthly idea why you would ever want to do that, but evidently it's pretty popular. And my Facebook, or just called Facebook, where you can go on and post pictures of yourself and your friends and tell them what you're doing, which again, I'm not sure why you would want people to know that, but it's pretty popular. And people have Facebook parties, right? Long before that was a place called My Place, Home. It was the original my place, a place that you could go no matter what happened in your life and you knew you'd be welcome. That's why I love what Robert Frost writes when he says, home is a place you don't have to deserve. That's home. Now, just a couple more quickly. It's also a place of security. It's supposed to be the place where you can go when the world's out to get you and you feel safe. Now, I know none of you in the room were mean boys and girls when you were little, that you were perfectly righteous and holy. But the Vines family, the four Vines boys, I'm just going to tell you, they were evil. <laughs> they were not good kids. And we usually spent most of our time with the other family in the neighborhood that were also labeled as evil. So there's the Vines family and the Duggar family. And it's kind of like honor among thieves. We just hung out and talked about what new disasters we could bring up on the earth. And so in the summertime, we would play wiffle ball together. Remember the old game wiffle ball in the hot summer days? And my friend Jojo was my age. He had an older brother, four or five years older than me, bigger, stronger, and you know, it's intimidating at that age. And his older brother would constantly verbally abuse me and just, just, you know, pick on me, just endless. And finally, one day I got courage for about five seconds. Unfortunately, the courage was not accompanied by wisdom. <laughs> and, and when Jojo's older brother had his head turned, I took the wiffle ball bat and I just whacked him as hard as I could on the head. And then the wisdom kicked in. And I thought to myself, I think I can run faster scared than he can angry. And so I knew that if I could just make it in the front screen door of our home, I'd be safe because my brother Tim, the, the Tennessee State Wrestling Champion, would be there waiting. And I was running for my life, literally. It was only about a block and a half. And I made it to the front door. By that time, Jojo Duggar's older brother had grabbed me by the shirt tail, but I ripped it apart, went inside, and there was my big brother. And my big brother had been waiting for this day. And he just pummeled Jojo Duggar's older brother. Just opened up a can, as they say. Just, just... <laughs> Just total disaster, okay? Now, I'm like that guy in the movie. I'm behind my brother kind of shadow boxing. I'm not really landing any punches, but I'm going like this and like this. I'm watching my brother, and whatever my brother does, I do, and I feel like I'm part of the action. So I felt like the victory was one with my brother and me. I felt like I had a part to play. 
And I'm sure somewhere there was my mother looking over to her two sons and saying, yep, these two sons are going to be pastors someday. (laughs) The point is, when you're struggling at school, when your world is falling apart, when you felt rejected, you know, when you asked that girl out and she rejected you, and not only did she reject you, she said something like, in your dreams are never in a billion years. You came home and you could come home and know that you were safe. And I know for me, I would come home. Now, you older people will understand this. Younger people won't have a clue, I'm sorry, and you'll probably lose a lot of respect for your senior pastor, but who cares? <laughs> I would come home feeling really bad, go to my room, remember your room, and I'd put this thing on called a record. It was really, really round, and it would go down on the record player, and there's a needle that would come out, and I would play my favorite John Denver song to make me feel better. Wait for it. Wait for it. Here it is. Hey, be back home. Remember that? Wasn't that great? Remember those days? No, you don't. Okay, but I do. I do. A place of safety and security and home. One one other thing, it was supposed to be a place of rest. I remember when my father would come home after a long day of work, sitting in his lazy boy chair, he'd lean that thing back, and this was a ritual. Mom would bring him a cup of coffee. Of course, those days are over. And he'd take that cup of coffee, take a drink, and say the same thing. He'd say, mmm, nothing like a good cup of coffee. And my mom would wait for it, and so would we. And then he would say, anybody know where I can get one? (laughs) And then my mom would laugh, and we'd go on with the evening. I don't know if you remember, but back in the book of Genesis, in the story of Noah, Noah, after 40 days and 40 nights of rain, they're on the ark, and Scholars have figured out that somewhere between 355 and 370 days, Noah was actually on the ark with his family. I thought about that. Think about 370 days in a confined space with your mother-in-law. That would be horrible. But anyway, here's what happens. Noah is tired of waiting. He sends out a dove. And here's what Genesis 8 and 9 says. But the dove could not find a place to rest the sole of her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Now, this Hebrew expression... Uh, a place to rest the sole of your foot is an expression synonymous with the idea of home as a place of rest. Okay? Now, Nancy Orberg writes this about that. She says, this verse had to be written by a man because only a man would think of home as a place of rest. (laughs) And in a survey that I read this past week, they ask families, Where's your most favorite place in the house? And the men and the children all said the same place, which is the kitchen. That's right. But then they asked the wife. And it wasn't the kitchen. It was... Everybody's gotten it but you. What is it? What is it? The bathroom. Right. Because that's the only place you can go in and lock the door and be left alone. Right, right. Come on. You're just shy. Now, let me get, take a time out just a moment. So God designs home in the order in which it's supposed to function as a portal to something greater, as a foreshadowing of what life would be like with God. The problem is, I was speaking in Wellsford, New Zealand, when we lived in New Zealand, about an hour north of the city of Auckland, and I was speaking on the topic of God as our Father. And a young 22, 23-year-old lady came up to me after everyone had departed. And she said, Pastor Jeff, let me get this straight. You're telling me that God is our Father. I said, yes, He is. And she said, then I hate God. And she told me what her earthly father was like. Because for the truth of it, a lot of us see the glorified God as a glorified version of our earthly father. So that didn't resonate with her. And she told me a tearful story of drug abuse, of hate, of arguments, of violence. And I just want to say before we close this thing out, it's not okay when home is not a foreshadowing of life with God. It is not okay. And for some of you this weekend, you don't really want to talk about it. But in homes where you have parents fighting, where there's drug addiction, where there is a cycle of violence, where there's marital unfaithfulness. The best Christmas present you could give your kids, man, is to acknowledge where you are and get into Celebrate Recovery, where nobody's going to judge you. They're just going to love you. 
They're not going to ridicule you. They're going to forgive you. They're going to give you assistance to create the home that God originally intended to serve as a portal to what life would be like with God someday. So home is designed by God so that we would know someday there's going to be ultimate unconditional love, ultimate belonging, ultimate significance, ultimate security, ultimate safety. But here's the problem. Again, as we age, we lose it. Now, I told you from day one that this illness, whatever it is that I'm going through, that I was going to be straight honest. I was not going to hide anything. And I want to, be, I want to open that uh, door again just for a few minutes here. It's going to make some of you uncomfortable, and I'm sorry. But no, I'm not sorry. I'm not really sorry. Because it's worth it for those who are experiencing something similar. Folks, I don't think there's anything wrong with me. All the tests have come back. I'm as healthy as healthy can be. I'm starting to find out that I'm suffering from things like anxiety attacks or panic attacks. And I'm meeting with Ron Hall, and I had a great meeting with him this past week, and Ron believes, Ron believes that a lot of what's going on in my life right now is due to the death of my father. Okay, I, I want to be honest. I miss my dad. And I miss my mom. And I had no idea that when my dad died that I would feel orphaned, that I, I would feel like I've lost my identity that those memories of Christmas and with my brothers and home and summer wiffle ball games, they seem to be fading and I don't seem to be able to pull them back in. It's been so devastating to me that I, I started to question who I even am. Who am I? I? I've started to even question, should I be in ministry? Maybe I miss my calling. And I just want to be honest. I've lost my sense of home and I'm having a hard time getting back there. I'd give anything, I would give anything if I could just go back for one Christmas and listen to my mom sing those stupid songs as she's walking around the house during Christmas. Just one more time that I could eat sugar cookies and pumpkin pie. Just one more time that I could hear my father warn my mother that if she keeps putting these big, huge Christmas bulbs on this live tree that she's going to burn the house down and a tiny argument ensue. I would give anything to hear that again. I really miss my mom, and I really miss my dad, and I'm scared, and there's a place inside me that knows I'll never have it again, and I can't even explain it. I'm almost embarrassed about it, but I can't deny that it's there. I'd give anything to go back with my dad and box with my dad again. Oh, okay, it wasn't really boxing. It was more me blocking his punches with my face, but I, I wish... <laughs> I wish I could go back to that. I wish I could go out in the garden and just pick the tomatoes with him and watch his face light up to talk about how big they are this year. I wish I could sit on the side of his bed and eat a Powell's double cheeseburger, 100% cholesterol, while watching another episode of Bonanza. I, you know what my dad would have said about cholesterol? that They didn't even have it when he was a kid, and if they did, they would have fried it. And so... <laughs> I'd give anything to go back. To, I would even give anything to go back behind the woodshed one more time with dad. Dane Johnson told me, when you go back to see your dad, make sure that you tell him all the things that you want him to hear. You may not see him again. And sure enough, the last time I saw my dad, I was able to sit down on the bed and I said to my dad, Dad, I want you to know you did a great job with your boys. And I love you. And my dad died before I could see him again. And I thought that would give me great healing. And it did to a degree. But I'm just being honest. I, I, I feel lost right now. I feel like there's a way home and I've not found it yet. And maybe because I suppress all of it and keep it in, it comes out in other ways. It's like when my dad died, my security, my belonging, and my acceptance all went out the door. And I'm desperately trying to find my way back home. But I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm still standing. I'm still standing. And this Christmas sermon right now, as I've studied this week, is helping me heal. 
Can you tell a difference in my voice already? Can you tell it's been a different week? And I think a lot of it has been because of this journey, because I finally, I think I'm starting to get it. And I'm ashamed to say that I didn't get it before. But the reason we don't have any artifacts from Jesus, the reason we don't have any of his clothing, the reason we have nothing left of Jesus' carpenter shop is because Mary and Joseph might have traveled a five kilometers away from home on that first Christmas. The wise men or the kings may have traveled a long distance, far, far away, to be at the manger scene in the nativity. The shepherds might have left their fields. But listen, Jesus wins the award on the first Christmas for who traveled the farthest to get here. God wanted to make sure we never fell for the lie that Jesus' home was here. That his mission was a carpenter's job. That Jesus is from another place. And what God wanted us to know in the first nativity, the only nativity, is that Jesus left his home so that you and I would never have to be homeless again. In the West, when men get together, we ask each other one question, what do you do? And based on your answer, we put you in a pecking order, right? And how much money you make, what kind of car you drive. In the East, it's totally different. It's not what do you do, it's where do you stay? Where is your home? What is the name of your family? They asked Jesus that question when he called the first disciples, and Jesus' answer was a simple one. He said, come and see, and he never took them. Because his home is not here. Jesus, listen, left his home so that you and I would never have to be homeless again. And all my life, I'm starting to recognize through this illness, all of my life has been a setup. Because even when the things in my life have been good, still there's been something missing. C.S. Lewis says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I'm starting to recognize there is a beyond in me. There is a beyond in you. And my father gave me security, but I still had times of fear and panic and anxiety. And my mother gave me love and forgiveness, but there were times it was difficult for her to do so. And there's times now that my wife gives me unconditional love, but still there's something missing. There's another love. There's a beyond in me that's searching for something. I'm looking for that place where I ultimately belong, where I will never feel insecurity again, where I will never feel anything but loved again, where there will be a place of eternal rest and all my fears and all my anxieties will dissipate. I want to return to my original home. I want to go back to the place I am really from. God is showing me in all this that my dad was a gift from God, that my mother was a gift from God, that my home life, all a gift from God, that my brothers, a gift, but they were all merely pointers to something greater, a portal, a small glimpse to something for which my heart truly longs. The psalmist said, deep calls out to deep. And I I try to explain that, and I always find myself lacking in the words until I've gone through this. And I think I can take a good shot at it now. I take you back to Victoria Falls, one of my favorite places in the world. And I stand there and I watch the water come down the Zambezi and fall in the Zambezi River below. And I want to tell you as I see that, there is a depth in that water. There is a sound, a thundering sound. And it resonates with something in me that is deep. It's almost like deep calling out to deep. It's the same feeling I have when I walk on my favorite beach in Murawai, New Zealand. It's the same feeling I have when I see a tree that is just blooming and is bigger than life or when I take a walk in the mountains or when I see the snow on the mountains as I drive down the 210. It's like a deep calling out to something that I'm longing for that goes even beyond that. As beautiful and wonderful as it is, it's a longing. And I'm starting to realize what that is finally. My ultimate home is not here My ultimate home is with God, and Jesus came to take me there. And only when you start to recognize that these are just foreshadowings of the ultimate place in which you belong, you will always live a life of panic and anxiety and frustration and depression. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, in his sermon, December 2nd, Christmas, 1928, said this, that the celebration of the Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, 
who look forward to something greater to come. He says, when once again Christmas comes and we hear the familiar carols and sing the Christmas hymns, something happens to us. The hardest heart is softened. We recall our own childhood. We feel again how we then felt, especially if we were separated from a mother. A kind of homesickness comes over us for past times, distant places, and yes, a blessed longing for a world without violence or hardness of heart. But there is something more, a longing for the safe lodging of the everlasting Father. Folks, David showed us that it's possible to be home even when you're far from home. He spent most of his life running from King Saul. He missed his family, spent lives in caves in the ground in foreign lands. And yet this is what he wrote in Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Lord, you're my home. And in Psalm 91, 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. If you are at home with God, there is rest, there is peace, there is belonging, there is security, there is safety, everything you're looking for. And Bill Hybel says, there are plenty of soldiers in mesh tents tonight who have a sense of home, even though they are living on a sand dune halfway around the world because they know they belong to God. Now stay with me. I've got a few minutes left. Do not look at the clock. I need your attention. That's how I want to end this, and I I want you to get this this Christmas. Most of us spend most of our lives running away from home. We do, because we don't want God to interfere. We want the safety, security, and belongingness, but we don't want Him to tell us what to do. And when you do that, you get farther and farther away from home. And your heart is looking for that place. You can't figure out why your autonomy is ruining your life. Did you ever run away from home when you were a child? I did. I had to borrow my dad's suitcase to do it. (laughs) And I put my clothes and my baseball mitt and baseball in the suitcase and I went out on the curb. I called my grandfather and I said, Granddad, I'm running away from home. You need to come and get me. I stood out on the curve for what seemed like an eternity, probably three minutes. My mother came running out. She said, Jeffrey, and remember, she's the only one that can call me that. Jeffrey, your grandfather's not coming. I said, why? Two reasons. Number one, he's already raised his family. He's not going to raise another one. And number two, Jeff, you're 17 years old. You're too old to run away from home. (laughs) There might be a little falsehood in that story, just a little. But the point is still the same. We spend much of our time running away from God, wanting our autonomy, and we're so depressed and we're so anxious and we're so afraid because we know we're not at home with the Father. Jesus came and lived a homeless life. He left his home so that you and I would never have to be homeless again. And here's how I want to end. Please stay with me. Please. Jesus was so passionate about letting you know that you don't belong here, that there's goodness and grace even while you're here, but he never wanted your sense of identity to be here, that through parables and stories over and over and over again, he used the language that the first century would understand. And this is one of my favorite stories. If you remember in the first century, people lived in what were called insulas. And these were just places, property, where you would have houses because you had the extended family living here. Grandma, grandpa, they took care of each other. And the son and the daughter and the husband and the wife. And they lived in their little insulas. And then part of that was a courtyard where you had the feeding troughs and the sheep and the cattle or whatever your family owned. And you'd raise them and live and exist together. Now the interesting thing is you had multi-families here. And there would come time for the young girl or the young man to seek a wife. And so the young man, let's say, in the family would tell his father that it was time for him to become betrothed or engaged, and he had his eye on a certain young lady. Now, here's the cool thing about that. Today, well, let me put it to you like this. After I've seen some of the girls that my son has brought home and some of the guys my daughter's brought home, I think arranged marriage is a pretty good idea. (laughs) And by the time you were 14 as a girl, you would be engaged, not married, but engaged, and for guys, it was around the age of 20. So then, after you've chosen, after the father has arranged the marriage, then he would go and bargain a price. 
And the, the phrase was coined in the first century, she who was bought with a price. You Bible readers, does that sound familiar? She who was bought with a price. And then they wouldn't send out invitations. No, you wouldn't say on July the 4th, 2012, Mary will be wed to Joseph. It doesn't go like that at all. The man in the relationship would go to the young woman to whom he's betrothed and he would say this, I'm going back to my father's house and we are going to build an insula, a place for you and I to live so that when we have completed it, I will come and get you so that where I am, you will also be. Does that sound familiar? And then the girl would just have to wait. There's no email, no text messaging. She would just have to wait. And it would be important for her to remain pure and devoted during the engagement period. But she may never see or hear from him, depending on how far away they lived. She was just trusting. Now, in this whole scenario, the son would be doing this. Dad, is it time? Is it time? Can I go? Can I go? And dad would say, no. We've got to finish building the insula. We've got to get things prepared. It is not the fullness of time. When things are ready, I will let you know. So month after month, it could be year after year. And then finally one day, the father goes to the son and says, okay, son, today is your day. Go and get your bride. And then there would be a parade of people. The shofar would blow the trumpet. And when the bride heard the trumpet, she would know that the groom party is in town. And she would get the wedding dress and the bridesmaids, similar to what we do today. And everybody in the town would come out to see what the bride looked like because nobody cares about the, the groom. He's just a necessary evil, just a prop. But everybody comes out to see the bride. And then he takes her by the hand and he says, today is the day. It's time to go home. Jesus said in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now the word mansion is the word in the original King James, but the Greek word actually means rooms. He's saying, in my father's house are many rooms. In my father's insula are many, many rooms. And Jesus says, one day I'm going to come back. There's going to be a huge parade. And Michael the archangel is going to blow the trumpet. And each of us, one by one, however God decides to do it, is going to be celebrated home. And here's what I'm learning in my own life. That's my real home. I have my home with my wife and my kids, yes, but still there will always be something missing for me and them as well because they are portals into what one day will become a reality. And it's helping me to realize this is not my home. It's not my ultimate home. My ultimate home is with God. And the things that I'm looking for and the things that are making me anxious and the fear that I have all have to do with the reality that not yet I have not fully given myself over to that place. And when I do give myself completely to the day of celebration that I will be home with God, then it will change the way I live here. The way I treat you and the way I look at you and the way I sacrifice for others. When I realize that is my real home, I will not stockpile my things here. I will store up treasures in heaven. Pray for me, I'll pray for you, that we all find our home. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. Again, like the nativity scene on my mantle, I feel like a stranger in a foreign land, but I know that the baby Jesus invites us home. For all who would come, we can come home. And I pray right now if there's any, anybody in the room that needs to come home that they would, something would resonate with them and they would find their way home, not only home for Christmas, but home for the rest of their lives. Father, we love you. And we thank you for Christmas. And we thank you for the gift of a dad who loves us and the gift of a mother who did so much for us. And for all those in the audience who still have their mothers and their fathers living, I pray that you would move in their hearts to such a strong degree to tell their mom and their dad they love them. For all that they sacrificed for the place of security and belongingness, and for those whose homes were less than ideal, I pray 
for healing, for forgiveness, and a reminder that although their feelings of home may have separated them from what was supposed to be a portal to God, they can still come home and God will fulfill the deepest longings of their heart. In Jesus' name.